Glad to see you. Glad to get back into our study of Daniel. We're in the eighth chapter this morning, and we've got a lot to cover, but I, I sure, I want to stop and talk a little bit about Daniel, but first, uh, I, I just got word that Randall is going to be having surgery in the morning to take his, is it a pick called a pick? Pick? His feeding tube. That's coming out, so I know he's looking forward to that. So let's keep him in our prayers. And also, uh, you know, talking about that, <clears throat> I'm planning to have surgery July the 10th to get this eardrum repaired. So hopefully I can hear a little better. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how that's going to turn out, but it's, a, it's an involved thing. The, the worst thing that bothers me about it is they said I, I need to lay out for about a week. So I'm figuring three days, that's about a week. No, no, I'm, I'm going to do what the doctors say because I want to get that thing fixed if, if that'll help. And they say it will, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. That's why, by the way, in case anybody's been wondering, I haven't yet gotten uh, hearing aids because I knew this was coming. It was in the works, and so that's why I haven't bothered to get the hearing aids, hopefully. And uh, I may wind up after this to have to get hearing aids, but then that's, that's another thing completely. So keep, keep me in your prayers with that regard. Um, Daniel, I just, the more I study and read and think about Daniel, the more it impresses me uh, the circumstances and how interesting they are. What are Daniel's circumstances? What is he? he he's, a, he's a captive, taken captive as a young man into the nation of Babylon, the country of Babylon, and yet throughout his writings, there's not one word of him whining about being a victim or anything like that at all. It shows him serving, which is exactly what Jesus teaches us to do, that he came to serve, not to be served. And he teaches us to serve. And he says, even when we do the best we can do, we're still unprofitable servants, which i I find interesting that Jesus says that he's saying it with regard to salvation and our morality and our, and our worthiness before God. But when you look at someone like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, and, and it's hard to think of them. It's impossible for me to think of them as unprofitable servants because I am profiting from their experiences. And they went into that captivity and apparently intended the entire time to be faithful to God, and that's exactly what we see them doing. And Daniel's getting these revelations, these dreams, not for himself. This isn't God saying, Daniel, I want you to know what's going on here next week. Doesn't do that. Doesn't get a warning about the lion's den or about the, the fiery furnace that his buddies were tossed into. Doesn't get anything about that, but he's getting these visions for the future, the distant future, and he's being told, seal them up because the time's not yet. They're a few hundred years off in their fulfillment or more. And he gets them. He writes them down faithfully. I don't even know if he understands everything that's going on. But he's just following through. And there's so many lessons for me in this. To see this guy in a circumstance that is not obviously the best. Captive in a foreign nation. But he serves in such a way that he doesn't make himself odious through his uh, religious demands. We see him in the very first chapter asking that he might have uh, some favor with regard to their diet, and, and that's granted him, I think, by the grace of God in one way, but also his endearing qualities to those who were there on the other. And in less than a year's time, when Darius takes over Babylon, Darius has come to love the man so much that when he is falsely accused and Darius has to put him in the pit with the lions, Darius spends the night, uh, no sleep, no food, no drink, no pleasantries, and in the morning he rushes to see how Daniel's doing. That speaks volumes to me about how Daniel lived before other men, even though they may not have known God like he did. And there are just a lot of lessons in here that aren't at first obvious until you, you read and you think about it. And you wow, that's never thought about that before. How many times do you do that when you read and study your Bible? You think about what it says. Oh, never thought about that before. Huh? never looked at it that way. This book is, 
It's from God. That's <laughs> what more can I say than that? Well, all right, that's enough of my uh, expounding on the impressions that I've gotten from this book this whole time. Let's do our review quiz, and then we got to move on. we got some ground to cover today in Chapter 8. All right, review quiz. Everybody get one, by the way? we got got some back there. In Daniel 7, Daniel reports a vision in which he saw four animals. Each of these represented an earthly kingdom. List below the four animals and the kingdom which each represented. What was the first animal? Lion, Lion, which represents Babylon. The next animal was a bear, which represents Medes and the Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire. And then there was the leopard which represents Greece, the Grecian Empire, Alexander the Great coming across so swiftly, uh, leopard with wings. And then the third or fourth one, rather, was a, how was it described? A beast. What kind of a beast? Terrible. Terrible. Great beast. It doesn't even say, well, it's this kind of an animal or that kind of an animal. It just says a beast, a great and terrible beast. It's like God leaves it up to our imagination to think of what kind of a beast it might be. Now in Revelation, we see the beast represented as a dragon, great red dragon. No, I don't mean to put that imagery in Daniel, but I'm just saying, yeah, that's a scary thing. And this was a scary thing, great and terrible. The the metals, what was the metal in the image of Babylon? The head of gold. gold. And then the chest and arms of silver. That related to the Medo-Persian Empire. And then the belly and thighs of bronze. That would be Greece. And then the legs that were iron. Going down to the feet that were part iron and part clay. So those are the four metals representative of the four kingdoms which were represented by those four animals, you kind of get the idea God's trying to get a message across to us. And it's interesting. Remember, he's not getting this message across to Daniel. And, hey, Daniel, wait till you see all these things happen. He's not going to see it happen. He's going to be dead and gone and in the grave for hundreds of years before any of these things are fulfilled. But Daniel is giving him these visions. Daniel's writing them down, and they're for us. This is what Peter said. When Peter wrote about the prophets who talked about the salvation that was to come, and they didn't know what they were writing about. They were just getting the messages from God, writing them down. They weren't for themselves. They're for us. Think about that. These are for us, not even for Daniel. What did Jesus say? He who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than those who've come before. It's not talking about my quality or your quality. It's talking about the fact that we are in the kingdom. And that's what all of these messages are about when it comes right down to it, the kingdom being established. All right, number two, besides each of the four kingdoms you have listed, write the name of the metal. Well, you already did that. Wasn't I the one saying we need to hurry through this? Number three, in addition to the four animals, Daniel saw a blank of blank approaching the throne of God. This is in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 or 14. A son of man. Remember, he looks in the night visions. He sees those four animals come up out of the earth, and then he sees heaven. And the Ancient of Days is on the throne, and he sees one like the Son of Man coming. How was he coming? In the clouds. Coming in the clouds. Isn't that interesting from Acts chapter 1 when Jesus ascends after the resurrection? He ascends in the clouds. And the apostles watch the clouds receive him out of their sight. In addition to the four animals, Daniel saw a son of man approaching the throne of God to receive a blank. A kingdom. This kingdom will never be, never be destroyed, never be ending. This matches the blank in Daniel 2. And you could say prophecy or interpretation of the prophecy. The message, the kingdom, matches the kingdom in chapter 2. Different visions, same basic message. 
All right, let's read together chapter 8. I need four readers. This is chapter 8 of Daniel. Let me get my notes out here. We're looking at uh, the first reader needs to go 1 through 8. Who wants to take the first 8 verses? All right, Larry. And then 9 through 14. Who wants 9 through 14? Daniel, okay, Janie. And then uh, 15 to 20. Uh, Mike, and 21 to 27. Anybody else? All right, Brandy. Let's go. Chapter 8. And I told you of the rain I fell to Sajor, the king, a vision appealed to me. Daniel, subsequent to the one which appealed to me previously. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Ula Canal. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a lamb which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, that one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up first. I saw the lamb budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him. Nor was there anyone to rescue from his power, but he did as he pleased and magnified himself. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came, he came up to the lamb, that had the two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him. And he struck the ram, and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hauled him to the ground, and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven. And some of the beasts and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the principal host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And the host will be given up to the spirit, together with the regular burnt offering, because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled on the foot? And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored to its rightful state.
destroy, destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will make deceit a success by his influence. And he will make himself great in his own mind. And he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. And the vision of the evenings and mornings, which has been told, is true. But as for you, keep the vision secret, because it pertains to many days in the future. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up and carried on the king's business, but I was astounded at the vision, and there was no one to explain it. All right. So quite a vision Daniel has, such a vision that he says he was astounded, exhausted, sick for days over these dreams. You ever had a dream that made you sick, just upset you? Get up in the middle of the night because you've had a dream and you can't go back to sleep and you try to find a way to comfort yourself? Uh, if you ever find that circumstance, uh, turn on Mary Poppins. Just watch Mary Poppins. <laughs> I, I know, it sounds crazy. But for me, that, that'll do it. Also, another one that'll do it is, uh, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, uh, Hello, Dolly, with uh, Barbara Streisand. Uh, just, just some practical tips on handling stress in the middle of the night. <clears throat> All right. So a dream. How many animals? Two animals. A ram. A ram that is rammed. What ram's the goat? I mean, what ram's the ram? Uh, okay, yeah, a goat rams the ram, and, and these, of course, represent two nations. So let's let's get into the chart, fill out these blanks, and see what we can, what sense we can make of it. All right, the first blank, Daniel chapter eight, verses three to four, a blank. What animal would you put there? A ram, and then drop straight down. That ram has two horns, and the longer one, the higher one, came up. Last, So that's the Medes and the Persians. The Persians were the dominant. Just like the bear. Do you remember anything special about the bear? It was raised up on one side. One side was raised up. So it's the Medes and the Persians. The bear represents the Medes and the Persians. One side's raised up. Well, that's the Persian side. One horn is longer. That's the Persians. It was pushing westward, northward, and southward. It conquered all. Then you get down to Daniel 8, 5 to 14. We're still in that first column going straight down. Then we see a blank come from the blank. A goat come from the west over the whole earth. It did not touch the ground. What does that seem to signify to you? I mean, just at first glance. He's moving on. I have long had the fantasy that I could press a button on my car and it would lift up, the wheels would fold under it, and I'd take off. Traffic jams, forget it. I'm road construction, who cares? I'm flying. This is what the goat did. He did not touch the ground. He had a notable blank between his eyes. A horn. What does a horn represent in scripture? Power. Anytime you see a horn, there is power. This goat smote the ram, breaking the two blanks, broke both of his horns, trampling him before the, before the river. So he's, he's in a particular place. He is in his home ground. The blank magnified himself. We're going on the back page now. But the great blank was broken. His, that, the, the goat magnified himself and his horn was broken. And the blank or, uh, and the blank horns came up in his place. Four. Four horns. I hope we're not moving too fast. So we got a, we got a goat. Which direction is the goat looking? He's looking to the west. He's been conquering to the west. He is in the west. But this goat comes from the east, heading west, and he's, he's coming so hard and fast, apparently, he's not even touching the ground, and he rams into this ram, 
breaks the ram's horns and tramples the ram right there by the river, his own river. And then somehow the goat's horn, his notable horn that he has between his eyes, is broken. doesn't say how, it just says it's broken. That's all we need to know at this point. And when that horn is broken, what happens? It's just like nut grass. You ever pull up a thing of nut grass? What happens when you pull up a thing of nut grass? Four more come back where it was. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Sound reasoning. You can't argue with that. I was wondering yesterday. Can you eat that stuff? Is there some use you can have for it? Can you grind it up and make it into a bug repellent? What can you do with that stuff? If you could find a use for nutgrass, man, you'd be a millionaire. Uh, where are we here? Out of one of the blanks comes a little blank. Out of one of the horns comes a little horn that grew in power. That's not a blank, but I want you to see that's what horns are about. They're about power, about authority. He grew in power to the southeast and toward the blank land. What land was described here? The beautiful land. What do you think that is in the mind of God? Seemed like Israel to me. Remember that the major horn, the notable horn that the ram had, it's broken. Four horns pop up in its place. And then from one of those horns comes another little horn. And that little horn goes towards the beautiful land. It says, he threw down some of the starry blank. Starry host. And he trampled them. He set himself up as the prince of the host and took away the daily sacrifice. So we know he's talking about Israel. He's talking about Jerusalem. He's talking about the temple. He's talking about Jews. And he's talking about temple worship. Because of the rebellion of the host. Oh, wait a minute. That turns things on its side here. Because of the rebellion of the host, the daily blanks are given to him. The daily sacrifices. And truth was thrown to the ground. Blank, blank for the vision to be fulfilled when the sacrifices will not be offered and the rebellion that caused the, this desolation will be over and the surrender of the sanctuary is at an end and those two blanks you put in, how long? How long are we looking at? And then the next blank down, 2,300 days, 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be re-consecrated. All right, that's, that's quite a bit of stuff. Uh, tell me something about Alexander the Great. What do you know about him? Do what? He's dead. <laughs> he, he is dead. He died young, 33 years old. He's the goat. He brings his Grecian army across and swiftly conquers all the way over to the Medo-Persian Empire where he takes them out as well. Shortly thereafter, he dies. His kingdom falls to four of his generals. From one of those generals, from the Seleucid family of, of Greece, a royal family, rises a fellow by the name of Antiochus IV, who is Epiphanes. Every time I look at it, I have trouble pronouncing it. But, but that's the guy that goes into Jerusalem thinking there has been a rebellion of the Jews, and he wipes out a bunch of Jews. He desecrates the temple. He offers a pig. On, uh, on the altar, takes away the sacrifices for six years and four months 
which if you if, if you work that out, it's about it's right at 2,300. It's about 10 days off of 2,300 days. So there's your 2,300. And Daniel's getting this vision. He doesn't know what's happening, but he knows it's not good. And he knows the reason the sacrifices are taking away is because of the, the wickedness of the Jewish people. Now think about that. The wickedness of the Jewish people again, yeah. See, that doesn't end in Judges. In Judges, you see the cycle of Israel being prosperous, getting lackadaisical, becoming sinful, God sending punishment. They repent. They're restored. They, they go back into sin. God sends punishment, raises up a judge to deliver them from the punishment when they repent. It's, it's the same cycle over and over. Where is Daniel and why is he there? He's in Babylon because the Israelites have been so wicked, God sent Babylon to punish him. What's going to happen in 70 years? God's going to bring them back. They're going to rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple. They rebuild the temple first. Then they rebuild the walls. The city's reestablished. That's Ezra and Nehemiah. And then the people are going to fall into sin again. And because they fall into sin again, he's going to bring Antiochus Epiphanes on them. And then eventually he'll send his son. They'll reject his son. And he's going to send the Romans in AD 70 to wipe out the temple. Not just to wipe out the temple and punish the Jews, but to make a clear statement. The old law is over. No more Judaism. No more temple. No more Aaronic priesthood. No more Levitical priesthood. If you're a believer in my son, you're baptized into my son, you are a priest. You are the temple. He is your sacrifice. He's your high priest. All that's going to change, and Daniel's just getting visions that, that are leading up to what's going to happen in history. And he says at the end, boy, there's no one to tell me what this means. Think about the burden that he had, having these dreams, knowing they were from God, they meant something. He wrote them down, but he doesn't know what they're about. Keep in mind... What a great man Daniel was, but these dreams were not for him. They're for us. We're sitting here in the 21st century reading what Daniel wrote, and God says, see, guys, I was thinking about you all along. My kingdom was coming. I let Daniel go into captivity, but I took care of him all the while he was there. I let these other four boys go into captivity, but I took care of them. I brought my people back after 70 years. They rebelled again. I had to send a, a Greek guy to straighten them out, to take away the sacrifices from the temple. Now think about that. You're Jewish, and now you can't offer sacrifices for six years or more. What do you think's happening spiritually in the mind of those people? They might be saying, you know what? <clears throat> What's happening with our sin? We can't practice what God gave us. Well, why can't we do that? Because we were idiots. Now, can you say that as a preacher? You ever say that to yourself? You ever look in the mirror and go, you goofball? What'd you do that for? What'd you say that for? That's our state as human beings. Yeah, they were idiots. They were goofballs just like you and me. Everybody is. Everybody is. We've all sinned and hadn't. It's just not that we, we all have sinned. We all continue to sin and fall short of the glory of God. But that's what the gospel is all about. And all these visions are God saying, I'm sending you my kingdom. It's coming. Just wait. Just hold on. And when it comes, it's going to be an everlasting kingdom. Nothing's ever going to happen to that. I'm going to show you kingdom after kingdom after kingdom. It's going to rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall. But my kingdom won't fall. It's not the kind of kingdom you're thinking about. Different kind of army, different kind of power, different kind of warfare. But it's more real than anything you've seen. And just like Daniel didn't quite understand his vision, I don't think we'll quite understand all of it until the day that the Lord returns. When he comes back and we see his face and we see his glory, and we're standing there in awe. It's like, this, is, this is why. This is why we kept... The faith. This is why we practiced what God told us to practice. This is why we brought our kids. This is why we talked to our neighbors. Man, oh, we got more blanks to fill out, Marty. Quit. Uh... Back to the first page, first side of the, the worksheets. Middle column. Middle column. The vision 
involves what happens in the later portion of the time of wrath, the appointed time of the end. By the way, Daniel uses that phrase quite a bit in, in Daniel. You look it up yourself, it occurs several times. Time of the end. He's not talking about the end of times, but, but the time of the end of things. There are a lot of ends in Scripture. Uh, you look at Matthew 24, I think, especially when he says, uh, talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, and he says, uh, all these things uh, will come to pass uh, within this generation and then he talks about the gospel being preached to the whole world. And he says, then the end will come. And the end is not the end of the world. The end is the end of Judaism. And Paul in Colossians chapter 1 says twice, the gospel's gone out into the whole world. When did he write that letter to the Colossians? Just before AD 70, when Jerusalem fell. So the gospel went out to the whole world, and then the end came. But it wasn't the end of time. It was the end of Jerusalem. And this is another end that's not the end of time. And he mentions it several times throughout the book. Uh, just references. I wrote them down somewhere here. Uh, 8, 17, and 19 here in this chapter, but then in 11, 35, 11, 40, chapter 12, verse 4, chapter 12, verse 9. He also talks about it in 11, 27, and 9, 27. And Ezekiel does the same thing in chapter 21 and other places. He talks about the, the end that is not the end of time. So don't let that throw you. All right. Still at, back in the first part of the page, first chart, middle column, the ram represents the kings of Media and Persia. Then you go all the way down to Daniel 8.21. The first king is that notable horn. <clears throat> you look across to the left, you see in that block, there's that notable horn between his eyes of the, the goat. The back page, four blanks will arise out of this one kingdom, four kingdoms. Alexander will die, four of his generals will split his empire into four kingdoms. And then Daniel 8, 23, a stern-faced king shall arise. He shall become very strong, but not by his own power. My translation has insolent, and if you're looking for stern-faced, it might not be in your translation, but mine says insolent. Some of those words can be translated in various ways, but they all mean essentially the same thing. He'll destroy the holy people there. No blank to fill in, but that's what he'll do. And then you get down to the last block. Daniel is told, seal up the vision because it is of the future. You don't need to know it, Daniel. I'm giving it to you. You write it down. That's what he did. All right, back on the first page. And Stafford in the top part of that block does a little explaining. He says, not the end of time, but the time of the end, the period of wrath. This would mean that the vision is about things that will occur near the end of a period of persecution of God's people. That is, near the end of the time climaxed by Antiochus Epiphanes. Who is, uh, or rather... The two-horned ram is the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. Remember, Stafford likes repetition. He keeps bringing things back up. That's, so we remember who that ram is, what he represents. Next block. The blank horn came up later but was stronger than the blank horn. The larger, but think of it as the Persian horn. The larger horn is the Persian horn. And these are details that God adds to the vision to give it, I think, more understandability and more legitimacy. The blank kingdom conquered to its west, north and south. And that is the eastern kingdom. That's how it's expressed in the text. The eastern kingdom conquered to its west, north and south. The goat is the king of Greece. John. Okay, yeah, we're going fast. In that top block, it's talking about the two-horned ram. It's the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. And the two-horned ram, one of the rams comes up 
later, but it's longer, and that horn represents the Persians, and that's the second block. The Persian horn came up later, but was stronger than the Median, the Medo part of the Medo-Persian Empire. Any, any alibis? Need more blanks filled in? All right. In the Eastern Kingdom is the next block conquered to its west, north, and south. And the goat represents the king of Greece. Especially the horn. All right. Still in the third column. Yes, where are we? Take a look at verse 21. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece, and the larger horn that is between his eyes is the first king. That's Alexander. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from, its, from his nation, although not with his power. So these four generals will divide the kingdom, but, but it's not going to be as strong as it was under Alexander. And then, in the later period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. This is the small horn that rose from one of the four, who's uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. That's hard to keep up with all this. And Antiochus Epiphanes, he's, he's from that Seleucid dynasty. He takes over the area we would now call, it's referred to as Palestine. And that includes Israel, Jerusalem. And when you read the historians, they're not real clear on why he came to Jerusalem and began his persecution. But he obviously hated the Jews. Put that in today's context. Is there another people on the face of the earth more persecuted than the Jews? That ought to speak to us about the legitimacy of everything the Bible says. In the Bible, where does God call Abraham? We're introduced to Abraham in chapter 11 of Genesis, and God calls him in chapter 12 and says, I'm going to make you view a great nation. And right there he says, everybody who blesses you, I'm going to bless. Everybody who curses you, I'm going to curse. And from that point on, nations have lined up as to whether they will be a blessing to Israel or a curse to Israel. And we're seeing the same thing today. How, how far does that promise of God go about the blessing and the cursing? I, I don't know. But everybody knows who the Jews are. <laughs> everybody knows they are the people that God brought forth or there is a connection between them and God like no other nation had. Everybody knows that, especially the devil. And just imagine if, if he could wipe them out, if he could say, I wiped out, the nation of Israel. How would that look as far as who's stronger in the spiritual world? It hasn't happened, has it? Not only has it not happened, it's like God says, let me just show you something. I'm going to put these people in a tiny little sliver of land, and if you've ever been there, you'll notice one thing about it. This place, there's no place to live here. It's all rocks. And yet, you, you, you do a little research and you find out the technological advances that have been made by Jewish people, the inventions, the breakthroughs, and what they have done with the land. When we were over there, I was blown away. They have brought in soil from somewhere and they have irrigated places and they're raising crops. And I'm thinking, well, that must be for these people to eat. No, no, this is stuff they send overseas. They make money with it. Who consumes the most, uh, who, per, per, per capita, who consumes the most turkey in the world but the Israelites? It's like these people, they know how to do it. And everywhere they go, what happens with the Jews everywhere they go? They prosper. They prosper. Even during the Black Plague, period of the Black Plague, bubonic plague in Europe, 
People hated the Jews because they thought they were using witchcraft to protect themselves from the bubonic plague. All they were doing was following the, the hygiene stipulations of the covenant God gave them. That's all they were doing. Simple things like God said, when you go, when you go out to go to the bathroom, you, you take a shovel and you cover it up. I don't want to see that stuff. That's basically what God told them when they were in the wilderness. And so they, that's what they do. They, they cover their waist. They wash their hands. It's just simple things like that. And they were accused of witchcraft and persecuted because of it. It's just interesting. There's no way you can get away from the fact that the, the evil spiritual forces in the world hate the Israelites. It's like if we can take them down, we can show how much stronger we are than God. And that's, that's some of what we're seeing here in Daniel chapter 8. All right, observations, questions, comments, anything? We got to quit. Have we had two bells? No, have one bell. Well, oh, I forgot. Did you make a PowerPoint? There's Babylon. There's where it was before it was taken by. Who came next? Medo-Persians. Throw the Medo-Persians up. There's how it spread under uh, Darius and his cohort, and then came the Greeks. And there's the Grecian Empire. And show us, did you find a picture of Antiochus? Okay. I, I did all this at home, and then I forgot to send it to Hal. So he asked me if I had a PowerPoint. I said, man, no, I had a PowerPoint. but had three nice maps on it. And he said, well, where are they? I said, well, this was this. And he found them and made a little PowerPoint real quick. But crime and alien, man, you couldn't find a picture of Antiochus Epiphanes? Just messing with you. I don't think it's important we know what he looked like. It's important we know the part of history he fulfilled and what God did all about that. So, by the way, if, if you look him up, you'll find all kinds of different pictures of him. Uh, the, the one that seems consistently to be him is the stone head. Uh, that's, that's the one for what it's worth. All right. Uh, anybody got anything as we close? I hope you're getting as much out of this study as I am. I don't know how you could, but, man, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Lord, love you. Thank you.